everybody. I'm David Stark, I'm Chief Curator at the Columbus Museum, and I'll be talking today about uh, Andy Warhol. I titled the lecture, Andy Warhol, The Fame Factory. This is going to uh, be a, a talk on the life and career of Andy Warhol, um, uh, situating his um, art in the context of the pop art movement. The subject of Warhol's art that you see on the screen here represented, um, it's all about the world of commercial advertising and entertainment and mass culture. Uh, his art blurs the line between commercial art or pop culture and fine art and commercial art and fine art. And um, his style uh, is deliberately impersonal, um, mechanical, repetitious. He mimics the mass production of products and celebrity culture. And the two, uh, he makes it clear in his art that the two are intertwined. The um, artist himself, one of the most famous of all contemporary artists, a virtual household name, his stature in the art world looms large, and his style and his works are very well recognized and liked by the public at large. And he is the recipient of both, um, especially posthumously, um, both the serious recognition and popularity and fame uh, by the public at large as well. And both were important to him. He wanted to be respected in the art world and he also um, sought fame as well. And that idea of the pursuit of fame is a very important theme in his art and his life. So you see uh, Warhol in his 20s in uh, uh, 1958 on the left, and one of his uh, very early works on the right. Um, he grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, his parents were uh, Eastern European. They came from the country formerly known as Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And uh, the family anglicized their name. It was Warhola, and it was shortened to Warhol. He, his background is blue collar. His father was a coal miner who died when Andy was 12. He went, he uh, attended Carnegie Mellon, so he had a formal, um, he had formal art training and moved to New York in 1949. And this illustration from Glamour magazine shows that he found work the first year that he moved to New York and he had a successful commercial career as an illustrator. And at the same time, in his early years, he did uh, drawings and uh, watercolors um, as uh, what he considered fine artworks, as opposed to his commercial artwork, like the uh, magazine illustrations. And these he showed sometimes in galleries. Sometimes he would give them as gifts to friends or um, other artists or um, editors. Sometimes they were um, a help uh, to him in uh, securing work, for example. And um, this is an example of his whimsical uh, personal style. Um, and this is uh, titled, uh, it's a portfolio of uh, lithographs, color, hand colored lithographs, a print process that um, consisted of multiple pages and they were all about shoes. And he illustrated shoes uh, professionally, commercially. And so this was his private take on women's shoes. And the title is in uh, franglais, uh, A la recherche du chou perdu, um, a, uh, a takeoff on the remembrance of things past, a great literary work by Marcel Proust. And so it's a very lighthearted um, a compendium of uh, illustrations of shoes that shows his style that uh, had this uh, beautifully uh, um, sensitive line, um, decorative patterns. Uh, his personal style in the early years was compared to that of Aubrey Beardsley, um, Toulouse-Lautrec, or um, Charles de Muth that um, you, you can see if you uh, look in our uh, gallery three, um, our uh, DeMuth uh, watercolors such as this one that bear a certain similarity that um, our historians and critics have pointed out. And then uh, in a more ambitious mode in moving towards the style of pop art, he in the early 1960s began to paint and draw subjects taken from straightforwardly commercial sources like a dance a diagram, a, a comic strip, and he enlarged these images on canvases and didn't 
disguise. In fact, he emphasized the, the crudeness, the awkward style of the commercial sources that he used. And in many instances, uh, you can see especially in this Del Monte peach halves painting, he allowed the paint to uh, drip uh, deliberately. It's a reference to the dominant style at the time, which was abstract expressionism. Two examples of which you see on the screen, one by Jackson Pollock, which alas, is not in the Columbus Museum collection, but this um, work by Franz Klein was recently acquired. It hasn't been hung yet. Um, uh, and it, it, you can see that this is a style that was non-representational, in other words, totally totally abstract, no recognizable images, um, no reference to the everyday world. There was an emphasis on the spontaneous, the accidental. And to the younger generation of artists like Andy Warhol, this was art done in an artistic ivory tower that didn't have a clear relationship to the real world. By the mid-1960s, the movement that we know as pop art had coalesced. Uh, it represented a generational shift from the older abstract expressionist artists to the uh, pop art generation of the 1960s. And so artists like Roy Lichtenstein or James Rosenquist were closer to the age of Warhol. And the images like this um, represented an aesthetic shock to the art crowd in the public. Public. First of all, as opposed to abstract expressionism, it was realistic. Not only that, but the images were produced in a, a slick style that imitated commercial art, and the size was inflated. Right? These works um, showed um, images that were much larger than their sources. So you take a little comic book illustration and blow it up to the size of an abstract expressionist canvas. This was considered outrageous at the time. And the artists, many of them had uh, commercial art backgrounds. For example, um, Lichtenstein had worked as a designer of display windows, an engineering draftsman. Um, uh, although he taught art, he was essentially an academic fine art uh, instructor or professor, but he it did commercial work as well. And James Rosenquist, you can see most clearly, um, his background was in billboard painting, and he deliberately transferred that style to his pop art. And then you have mixed media collages in the art of um, uh, Robert Wesselman, who included everything including the kitchen sink, literally, in his work, and a bar of soap. Um, and, and you can see in all of these instances, in Warhol as well, um, the um, deliberate visual impact of commercial art, the bright colors, the aggressive compositions, the um, images seem to spill out of the canvas, or they actually are three-dimensional in the case of uh, Wesselman's works. And so this presentation of subject matter with the flair associated with the commercial mass media was something very new in the contemporary art at the time. So back to uh, Warhol, his favorite subjects, uh, as I said in my introduction, commercial products and uh, celebrity culture, um, uh, celebrities, uh, actors, uh, entertainers, performers um, were presented as commercial commodities. These are not images of the actors themselves, Elvis Presley, Marlon Brando, but they're um, presentations of images of the entertainers. He used uh, publicity stills, uh, uh, photographs that had already been taken. Uh, then his assistants would uh, silkscreen the photos onto canvases um, using this uh, photo transfer process of uh, silkscreening. And sometimes Warhol didn't even choose the image, but l allowed his assistants to do that. And uh, what's notable about both his men and women, but maybe it's even more um, distinctive with the male figures, um, he uh, put uh, makeup, uh, lipstick, and eyeshadow on Elvis, for example. And uh, it, that is not only a reflection of the gay culture, or in the 60s, it was just the gay subculture of which Warhol was um, a part as a gay American artist, but he emphasizes the artificiality of the entertainment industry. His stars are like products. And um, notice also that he emphasizes the medium and the flatness and two-dimensionality of the medium in which he's working. You have 
you have these colors, um, both the background and the clothing of Elvis, for example, that is very two-dimensional and flat. And there is the uh, fading and smearing of the silk screen so that you're very aware that you're looking at a photograph. And so that preserves an element of abstraction and a very important uh, tenet and principle of contemporary 20th century art is the acknowledgement that a painting or a two-dimensional work is just that. It's a flat two-dimensional work on a flat surface. Um, you acknowledge the physical reality of the medium uh, and anything that is represented on that flat, flat surface is a, uh, an illusion. And so it, Warhol uh, reinforces the, um, the, the materiality and the reality of the flat medium in which he's working. Thus, pop art can be called modern or modernist. Some call it postmodern, but I tend to think of it more as, it, well, maybe transitional, but this abstract element of pop art makes it to me uh, the last phase of modernism or late modern art. So you have um, the issue of multiples or serials. Why is Elvis reproduced four times? Um, why does he have 100 cans of Campbell's soup or uh, so many um, iterations of the same object? Uh, he is famous for his cryptic quotes. Uh, he, one of his most famous quotes, um, the reason I'm painting this way is because I want to be a machine. And so he's deliberately going against the grain of the individuality, the spontaneity of abstract expressionism and seems to be embracing the commercial culture of mass production and mass entertainment and communication that he's portraying in his art with the subject matter and style. So um, it is consumer goods on the supermarket shelf. You can take it literally. You'd see multiple cans of Campbell's soup in a grocery store you also see them um, reproduced. You can think of uh, television screens showing uh, multiple uh, uh, cans of soup or uh, multiple copies of newspaper or, or magazines, advertisements in print. And uh, these are disposable objects meant to be used once and thrown away. Uh, these were done in an era before recycling. And even though we're supposed to be recycling as much as possible today, I think there's, we're still in the age of disposable one-time use products. So um, 100 Campbell's soup cans, I just showed 210 Coca-Cola bottles. And uh, I'll, when I show the images of Maryland that are reproduced in serial multiple form, uh, just like the Coca-Cola bottles, there's the implication that um, people are disposable and their um, uh, images are uh, mass produced Produced in uh, this, our commercialized society in a way similar to um, the products, uh, consumable products like the beverage Coca-Cola. Um, I, I want to read one of his snarky comments, uh, particularly about Coke, and uh, he has this deadpan style that on the surface may seem to be um, celebrating or um, enjoying what he's talking about, but you can also construe it as um, a statement that's uh, passive aggressive or uh, sarcastic. So he said, what's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same things as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and just think, you can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke, and no matter, uh, no amount of money can buy you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it, the president knows it, the bum knows it, and you know it. So um, is he really celebrating that it's a democracy of Coke, everybody uh, can drink the same thing and we have equality, or is this uniform sameness a curse of modern life? And maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, here's a, an example of, in his early years, his art being, uh, and this is a, a really good example of the integration of uh, fine art and uh, commercial art, um, his serious uh, pop art gallery works were shown in a shop window uh, behind mannequins of uh, Bonwit Teller in 1961 for a spring fashion window display. 
And uh, this is, a, uh, as I said, a, a really great example of the blurring of the boundaries that had existed before and were pretty strict between um, high art and commercial art. And um, it, another thing about Warhol is that he embraced commercial success. And he thought of art as a business, and he was proud of the um, commercial prosperity um, that he uh, it, it was able to enjoy as a result of the brisk uh, sales and popularity of his art. And again, that went against the grain of the tortured, starving artist, uh, the uh, abstract expressionist generation. And. Um, uh, again, this uh, comparison of uh, a Campbell's soup can with a uh, pop art sculpture of uh, a popular food by Klaus Oldenburg uh, emphasizes this uh, a tendency to blow up or inflate the size of a commonplace smaller objects. Um, at first, the critics condemned pop artists as being a, a tasteless, simple-minded pinheads. They actually used language like that, um, <laughs> just like Donald Trump today. Um, <laughs> not applied to art, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, they uh, thought that, um, and, and there was the assumption, uh, many thought that uh, they just took um, a pop art at face value and uh, considered that it was glorifying the American way of life, elevating these mass-produced products um, uh, to epic scale. But um, it's probably more realistic to say that the artists Warhol and others were taking a more neutral approach. They weren't um, necessarily commenting or critiquing, but presenting uh, consumer culture as they saw it, uh, capturing or mirroring its essence, that uh, this is the way that late 20th century life is. Um, this is our, um, uh, our, our, the everyday culture in which we are, are now living. Um, and so what's the attitude, um, if we're thinking about the attitude towards fast food or commercial products, what about this, um, uh, the Death and Disaster series of Warhol? Um, there's a strain of his works, and he consciously called them Death and Disaster, that um, focus on uh, uh, violence in everyday American life, uh, whether accidental or intended. Uh, it, it started off with this headline of a, a, a plane crash. And this is, again, art about media, about the presentation of these um, events. Um, he's not really mocking uh, the, uh, the plane crash, but he's commenting on the way that it's presented to the public. And in discussing the genesis of his death and disaster series, he made these remarks. He said, I guess it was the big plane crash picture, the front page of a newspaper, 129 die. I was also painting the Maryland's. I realized that everything I was doing must have been death. And he didn't start painting his portraits of Marilyn Monroe until after she had committed suicide. It was Christmas or Labor Day, a holiday. And every time you turned on the radio, they said something like, four million are going to die. That started it. But when you see a gruesome picture over and over again, it really doesn't have any effect. And that last sentence is important too. There is an acknowledgement that we become desensitized to violence because of the proliferation of imagery that we see over and over, uh, repeated again and again. And remember, this is the age before the internet. So there was enough repetition in the media of the time, uh, television, motion pictures, and print media for him to make that statement. And so um, uh, intentional um, violence, violent death by uh, electric chair. Um, uh, his source, uh, as always, was a documentary photographs. And he adds uh, ironic aesthetic beauty to very grim and uh, ugly subjects. And remember that this was also a time in which um, uh, serial killers emerged, like uh, Richard Speck in the 1960s, and then this um, uh, uh, study, uh, the, the novel In Cold Blood, the, the, the docu-novel um, that spelled out this, uh, um, not only the, the gruesome killing and the crime uh, that occurred, but the um, execution of the 
people, the, the two men that committed the crime. And then uh, uh, car crashes, um, uh, painted many car crashes sometimes with the bodies um, uh, seen in the wreckage of the automobiles. And um, consider this in the context of Ralph Nader. His book on safe at any speed was published in 1965. So exposing uh, carnage on the highways because of unsafe practices of automakers. Gee, isn't it nice that we've moved past that? You know, we're still <laughs> arguing about and, and talking about this, and there's still exposés that continue today. So it's really uncanny the way that um, the things that Warhol emphasized in his art um, have uh, their their duration, uh, sadly, in many cases, is a long. They cast a long shadow. Um, uh, oh, so here's another controversy. He was commissioned by the designer Philip Johnson, the great modernist architect, to um, uh, 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 fill the exterior um, facade of the New York um, state uh, pavilion of the New York World's Fair in 1964. So um, Warhol, um, ever the provocateur, uh, decided to um, fill the space with um, faces from FBI wanted posters. And uh, um, so these images were mounted on a 388 foot square mural space. They were shown in a grid. Uh, and he called this his uh, Wanted Men series, his Most Wanted Men. And these were so controversial. He was glorifying criminals. There were um, even uh, complaints that he was uh, maligning uh, Italian Americans because so many of the criminals on the wanted list were Italian, uh, of, of Italian descent. And so at any rate, even the governor of Nelson Rockefeller got involved, uh, and so the faces had to be painted over, uh, and they were painted over in silver, and the um, faces of the criminals uh, were also um, made into a print series. So this is uh, Most Wanted Man number 10 on the left, for example. <laughs> and then the national tragedy of the decade, um, the um, uh, assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy, um, celebrity and glamour meet disaster, uh, so that you see uh, Jackie Kennedy uh, in the case of 16 Jackies in uh, the motorcade before the event, and then um, at the uh, uh, swearing in, uh, in the, of uh, Johnson um, after the, um, the death of Kennedy, and then the funeral. So, um, and this is the first time that an event like this was played out uh, with live media coverage, the, the funeral, uh, the coverage of of the assassination on live television uh, so that the visual images uh, that were replicated millions of times uh, in, in live uh, real time uh, was something that is reflected by Warhol in works like this. And then uh, back to uh, Marilyn. Um, who, uh, whose famous image was taken from, let's see, this date is 1964. The image was taken from a movie still uh, from uh, the film Niagara, which is a suspense thriller. Uh, it was just running on cable this morning. Um, it's, it's a movie shot in color, but the publicity still is black and white. And then, as I said before, using the flat artificial color. And, oh, Liz was part of the Death and Disaster series, too, because uh, if you... <laughs> Remember the publicity from uh, during the filming, uh, filming of Cleopatra, Liz Taylor almost died from uh, an infection that was resistant to antibiotics. And so whether it was sickness or death, you have this notion of um, uh, a, a morbid, a literally a morbid fascination with uh, celebrity, um, with that artificiality, the dyed hair, um, the lipstick, the eyeshadow, and so on, and the flatness and the multiples. So um, again, not a picture of Marilyn Monroe, but a picture of a picture of Marilyn Monroe, uh, the way that she's presented as a commercial product, and some say psychologically, that's what contributed to her suicide, um, the, the inability to cope with fame like this. And, and then he takes it to another level with the Marilyn Monroe diptych, um, where um, you not only have uh, a, 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 an extreme exaggeration of the replicatability of uh, celebrities, but it becomes um, comparable to a religious altarpiece, like a diptych, a folding altarpiece, implying that we worship celebrities today just like we worshiped saints, and her death is like the martyrdom of a saint. 
And then we're also reminded of his most famous quote, uh, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes, which is, isn't it truer today than it ever was in Warhol's time with reality television and the internet and uh, cute, uh, PewDiePie, uh, internet, uh, uh, YouTube sensations and so on, that, uh, whose fame is so ephemeral, um, but uh, they uh, really outdo uh, the, uh, uh, the notion of fame as it existed in the, the 60s or even the 80s, uh, when Warhol died in 1987. So um, his factory, um, that was what he called his studio. He moved to this Union Square location in 1964, walls of foil, uh, uh, suggesting the silver screen, the space age, um, or mirrors, uh, implying the narcissism of uh, celebrity culture. And it was a work, not only a workspace, but a place for socializing, for parties, with not only um, artists, but entertainers, writers, uh, celebrities, musicians, and uh, eccentrics and high society types, uh, including uh, what he called his superstars, um, people that were famous pretty much like Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian, famous for being famous, not because of any particular accomplishments or talent. So um, Edie Sedgwick, uh, a, a high society um, a woman uh, who looked beautiful and, and dressed fashionably, uh, is uh, transformed into a, a superstar, not only from her mere association with Warhol, but her um, a presence in his experimental films, like um, Empire on the Right from 1964, uh, which I, I'm showing you a still, but if I showed you the film, it wouldn't be very different because it's eight hours of a camera showing the Empire State Building uh, as the only change is you go from uh, light to darkness. Um, and uh, the, a film called Eat uh, showed somebody um, eating a mushroom for uh, 39 minutes, just a stationary camera on uh, somebody's head, asleep in five hours of a man sleeping. And then uh, getting back to Edie Sedgwick, the, uh, she starred in the film uh, Chelsea Girls, which consisted of two films shown next to each other, not video, but film, uh, shown simultaneously, uh, primarily just unscripted, unedited uh, footage of uh, the residents of an apartment um, in, in Chelsea very much like reality television today. So um, he was really ahead of his time in so many ways. Um, he uh, promoted, as time went on, um, the rock band, um, the Velvet Underground, um, uh, the uh, lead singer, Nico, um, shown here with uh, Warhol, was said to have sung like an IBM computer with the Garbo accent. And um, here's a, an album cover he designed for the Velvet Underground. And we're going to have an exhibition, I believe it's next year, of um, album art um, that I'm not sure if this will be included in it, but it very well may be. And then um, the uh, big event in the late 60s was the, the shooting of Andy Warhol by a member of his entourage, Valerie Solanas, who was um, a feminist who wrote plays and feminist manifestos. She formed the society called SCUM, or SCUM, which stood for Society for Cutting Up Men. And uh, she shot Andy Warhol in a fit of anger. And he almost died. And this is really a turning point in his life. Many said that he was never the same after he was shot. And for a number of years, he didn't produce art. He resumed uh, the, uh, production of art, painting, and uh, prints again in um, 1972 the year in which this work in our permanent collection uh, was completed. And this is an example, it's Karen Lerner, an example of a celebrity who wasn't necessarily or isn't a household name, but she was a staple of New York gossip columns, uh, the wife of Jay Lerner, the Broadway um, uh, composer or librettist who uh, wrote uh, musicals like My Fair Lady and Gigi. And um, the familiar... Um, uh, use, you see, of the appropriated photo. Um, he used a photo that was uh, taken and, and colored it with an orange monochrome, again, representing that modernist flatness 
but by the mid 70s, a new trend. Um, here's another celebrity from the fashion world, Halston. Um, he repeats the source photo twice, but now he uses this spontaneously brushed overlay, um, uh, scribbled or gestural background. He called it brushy. Uh, unlike the um, industrial uh, looking uh, smooth, hard edged and personal look of his art of the 50s. And um, this is related to a dominant movement that emerged in the later 70s and blossomed in the 80s, neo-expressionism, that was a movement that historically imitated the art of an earlier 20th century movement, uh, German expressionism. And it was an international movement. Rainer Fetting is a German example. There are examples in Italy and the US, like Julian Schnabel, before he became a film director, um, was a neo expressionist who glued broken dishes and plates to the surface of canvases. Um, and so it, it, it mimics the um, earlier movement of German expressionism, of which we have many great examples in our collection. Kirchner's um, uh, Tower Room is one. Um, uh, the, the movement of Germany in the early 20th century, in the World War I era, that again was uh, picked up in the 70s and 80s, and then uh, uh, Warhol was on board uh, in uh, terms of certain uh, um, uh, uh, stylistic flourishes of his art. And we move into the 80s with his uh, image and into the uh, Pace exhibition with his image of um, uh, uh, Eva Glimpscher, who founded Pace Columbus, uh, uh, Arnie Glimpscher, her son, who started Pace Gallery in, in Boston and, and then uh, New York, and the business partner, um, Fred Muller. Uh, again, repetition of uh, photographs and uh, flat uh, coloring of the different uh, layers. <clears throat> And the, I call it the piece de résistance of the exhibition, uh, the showstopper, for me, uh, is the athlete uh, uh, portraits by Warhol. The uh, um, athletes representing uh, various sports. It was spawned by uh, Los Angeles collector Richard Wiseman. One uh, uh, sport represented per athlete. And you see this incorporation of the gestural, painterly, neo-expressionist derived style. Uh, for example, in this image of uh, Pele, you've got the um, uh, very um, thickly applied and uh, gestural, spontaneous uh, paint. Uh, you have um, uh, Rod uh, Gilbert, uh, hockey, Pele, the um, soccer player, Dorothy Hamill, uh, the skater, um, Muhammad Ali, the boxer, and Tom Seaver, uh, baseball. And uh, uh, then there's um, only uh, one athlete per sport. No sport is duplicated. And the um, so you have OJ, before the murder or murders. Um, Columbus is his own Jack Nicholas, uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, um, the uh, jockey Willie Shoemaker, and Chrissy Everett. And notice that each is shown with the um, object connected with their sport. Um, in a way, and not to put too much emphasis on the religious angle of his paintings, but like attributes of saints. For example, our uh, Renaissance uh, portrayal of St. Agnes, whose attribute is a lamb. So these identify the celebrities and the notion that these are um, individuals who receive so much adulation and recipients of so much attention and fame uh, in a way like the saints of old and portrayed as such. And so uh, these, uh, this athlete series was exhibited as the exhibition makes very clear with some uh, photographs that I've reproduced here uh, that Andy Warhol did uh, visit the Columbus Museum of Art and this athlete series was exhibited uh, concurrently at the Pace Gallery and at the Columbus Museum. And you see him with the museum director at the time, Bud Bishop. And the works that are on our new wing walls were actually um, those that were exhibited in the Columbus Museum, but in a different arrangement. And you can see that in this uh, photo of the press conference that was held in the museum, there were more um, duplicate examples of each athlete. But in our installation, there's just one um, uh, image of each of the athletes. Um, so I wanted to play a um, 
uh, an interview with Richard Wiseman who talks about the genesis of the series and tells stories about what happened um, when Andy Warhol interacted with the athletes. I think I'll just let the interview clip speak for itself. How do they intersect and why did you bring together these athletes and Andy? Well, you know, first of all, I just felt that art and sport were like the two most popular leisure time activities. And there was no together. They didn't coincide. People who were into art just were not into sport and vice versa. I mean, we can find examples where that's not true. We can find me who liked both. You, know, you probably know people that like both. Okay, but I mean, generally speaking, those two those two areas just didn't coincide, and I wanted to coincide them. And Andy didn't know the difference in a golf ball and a football. I mean, he just completely didn't know the difference. So I came up to him and I said, Andy, what would you think of doing a series of athlete portraits? Oh gosh, what a great idea! Well, he said that to anything. <laughs> I mean, he said that to anything. Okay, so I mean, I wasn't really surprised that Andy Warhol said great idea. But I had to go pick out the athletes. I had to figure out which ones to do. So uh, that was a kind of a fun idea. But then you had to get them to do it. These were rock stars at the time. I mean, everyone wanted them to do everything. So I had to pick out the ones I knew. Well, before we get to the names, I, I want to get back to this issue of the relationship. <clears throat> I see a beautiful athletic performance as artistic. In other words, when Jerry Rice in his prime was catching balls for the San Francisco 49ers, some of the moves he made were very artistic, almost a ballet. That's right. So that uh, I mean, forget what he did after, but look at O.J. Simpson. That's the way correct. he ran. That's correct. Beautiful. So there is a bit of an art form in contact of sports. Definitely. So when you say that they don't go together, I would challenge that. They there, do go together. There is a relationship. I'm talking about the fans. Oh well, the fans, the, the beer bottle fans. Well, I mean, people who are into sports generally aren't into the arts. I'm generalizing. I mean, you know, people who watch the show, they can write letters and say, I like both. But generally speaking, they don't. They're basically separated. Now, you know, right now, when people are watching this show, there's a lot more people today that are into both. But then they weren't. Well, the, the, those you're selected, Muhammad Ali, Jack Nicholas, Chris Everett, Schumacher, Pelé, Tom Seaver, Kareem, Simpson, Dorothy, why? How did you select How did I pick them? They're all icons. They all were icons. Well, you know, listen, um, each one, every one, I can tell you a story about each one of these situations. I mean... Muhammad. That's what I'd like to hear about Muhammad Ali. Well, Muhammad Ali, okay, look, uh, the first one I went to was Raj Gilbert because I knew him. I hockey. had to get this started. Yes, hockey. Hockey. I had to get it started. A. He, he and I were good friends. B, he knew who Warhol was. Some of these guys didn't. He said, I'm honored to be included, okay? And then was Seaver. No, next was Shoemaker, a friend of mine knew him. And then Seaver, who knew Warhol. And then somebody said, I could go down to Deer Park, Pennsylvania, and Ali would be happy to because he knew who Warhol was, and he'd be honored. Once Ali said yes, Everybody. Because if Ali was in it, they wanted to be in it. Even Chris Everett and Jack Nicholas, who were very leery because this Warhol guy they knew about a little bit, he was weird, and they didn't want to look weird. And he felt that if he was doing pictures of them, they'd look weird. But begrudgingly, they went ahead. Because someone must have told them, yeah, you better do it. Who was the most interesting of the, the icons? Your favorite. Who was the most interesting to do the portraits of? Or the most interesting Your personality? Choice. Your I mean, choice. Well, I mean, they're all like, I mean, each one of these people, I mean, just, I mean, Jack Nicholas kept saying, you know, Andy made the, Andy told him to move your stick a little bit to the left, and Nicholas said, it's not a stick, okay, <laughs> this is a golf club. And Richard, does this guy know what he's doing? Sure. I mean, you know, I said, Jack, he knows what he's doing, trust me, I mean, he does. I don't know. This isn't a stick. I mean, this guy's going to, I mean, I'm going to look strange. I, you know, and I didn't want to say you looked strange anyway. But, anyway. <laughs> but so our, I think we can head cut it all... here and proceed. I have a few more images of Warhol's career uh, in the later years, in the 80s. 
Um, so he began uh, another enterprise, Ever the Businessman. Um, he started the magazine interview in 1969, and it prospered and thrived, got bigger, more colorful uh, as the years went on. And here's the cover uh, with uh, television star Joan Collins from 1984, uh, September of 84. Uh, and uh, then his uh, style uh, continued uh, in certain ways similar to his early subject matter, but adapting to the times when Campbell's soup was uh, sold in boxes rather than cans. And he even, and this goes along with the neo-expressionism whose exponents often um, refer to paintings of the past, uh, including the distant past like the Renaissance. In this instance, uh, in 1984, showed a detail of Leonardo da Vinci's Annunciation. Oh, and I should also mention that Warhol's religion was uh, uh, Byzantine Catholic, and he went to church every Sunday, apparently, so that um, there's something about uh, r religious ritual that meant a lot to him. And so the references to religion that one can interpret in uh, viewing his paintings are, I think, um, legitimately, um, it can be discussed with legitimacy. The uh, works, um, by, oh, and then I, I should say that um, this led to, um, or this is one of his last, uh, these, uh, 1986, 84, these are his last years, and he died in uh, 1986, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I said 87, I think it's 86, um, died unexpectedly going into the hospital, everybody's worst nightmare, going to the hospital for a routine procedure or operation, it was to get his gallbladder removed, and he never came out. Um, he died. And uh, there were so many possessions that he had, it took Sotheby's nine days to auction his estate uh, for a total gross amount of over $20 million. And Jeff, um, or the, uh, um, the legacy of Warhol is seen in so many uh, subsequent uh, artists and artworks. Um, for example, uh, pretty much um, the majority of works by Jeff Koons can be said to have a relationship with Warhol, but the celebrity culture um, uh, in something like uh, this image of uh, Michael Jackson. Here, um, it looks like the uh, artist is um, Rachel Perry Welty. Um, it looks as if she's taking uh, Warhol's uh, Brillo boxes or his uh, three-dimensional uh, sculpture uh, and using them straightforwardly. But these are miniatures. These are teeny tiny um, uh, re reduction in scale of um, uh, toothpaste boxes. So doing just the opposite of what Warhol did in inflating the size of the commercial products in many cases. And then in our own uh, museum, some people are saying, uh, or assuming that these uh, balloons on the ceiling are leftovers from opening weekend in October, but they're actually uh, works by Danish artist Jeppe Hein. They're uh, made of a, a hard plastic-like material, and they're hooked uh, or fastened uh, to the ceiling uh, of the new wing. But these are reminiscent, for example, of the um, uh, silver, uh, the, the pillows that were uh, inflated and um, uh, floating with helium in the, uh, the factory of Andy Warhol. And the um, uh, work by Warhol sits next to, Karen Lerner uh, is hung next to um, works that are directly related and inspired by uh, Micheline Thomas, who explores the celebrity of uh, African-American women and it's, it's particularly looks at the um, similarities and contrasts between uh, Oprah Winfrey and Condoleezza Rice uh, in images that resemble somewhat the style of Warhol, but they're made with uh, sequins. And um, then even our logo um, display area uh, has a reference to Warhol. Uh, this is a Campbell's Soup can. It's called Andy's Can um, uh, by uh, Eric uh, Cacioppo. And um, 
uh, the uh, reference to uh, Warhol in so many uh, contemporary works is very clear and evident. So um, the Warhol Museum uh, in Pittsburgh opened in 1994 with 4,000 works, um, not only Warhol's art, but his uh, memorabilia, his collectibles. He never threw away anything. Uh, warehouses of um, his papers, archival papers, and uh, objects that he collected. And um, the uh, website uh, is, uh, has a wealth of uh, information and, and images and documents, uh, reproductions, just Google Andy Warhol Museum. And um, so I thought I would close with this picture that I took this summer um, at an installation at the Museum of Modern Art that maybe some of you saw of Warhol's uh, early works, including uh, the uh, shoe uh, uh, prints, the shoe lithographs that I, I showed, um, some of the uh, books that he gave as private gifts, and his early uh, Campbell's Soup Can paintings, and the uh, Marilyn uh, series from the later 60s. And in the age today of uh, uh, selfies and social media, I was just really taken by the fact that uh, young ladies were lining up one after the other to get their pictures taken and probably promptly posted on social media websites in front of Warhol's paintings of um, Marilyn Monroe. So they're getting their 15 minutes of fame. And uh, that exhibition, uh, or the installation, closed in October. But um, the works, uh, for the most part, are in the permanent collection of the museum, so they, they still can be seen. So uh, with those remarks, I conclude. Uh, thanks for your attention. And um, I think we have uh, enough time for questions. Isn't there a series of Warhol uh, ink prints, like a flower suite or something? Yeah. Um, a, Oh, um, you might be referring to, there's a work in the Pace exhibition that I didn't show called Flowers, and he did a pretty extensive series of, um, of flowers that show the blossoms with flat colors and a kind of black and white photographic reproduction of the stems and leaves, and those were um, exhibited and uh, replicated, reproduced widely. He even turned them into wallpaper, flower wallpaper, by um, putting a series uh, frame to frame of the, the flowers on uh, the covered walls. Mm -hmm. uh, David, have they unpacked all of his boxes yet? Oh, gee, I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't know yeah. enough in detail about the, what, what's going on at the museum, but I imagine that even if they have unpacked all of them, they probably haven't cataloged uh, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think they're working to provide more and more material on the website. Uh, this isn't a question, but it's a comment. Uh, when Andy moved to New York, uh, he was part of a group that my husband and I were part of. And uh, we knew where he lived because he was the janitor of a, an apartment building. Wow. And at that time, his room uh, had supports across, and they were filled with Campbell soup cans. Wow. This was before he ever started doing the Campbell soup paintings. Oh, and I do have something to show you, David, afterwards, please. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. What a great story. Wow. Did he, can I ask you a question? So uh, I understand that he, his mother moved to New York uh, with him? I don't know about that. There no. were about 13 members of the class, uh -huh. of his fine arts class, that he attended oh. at Carnegie. At that uh -huh. time, it was Carnegie Tech. Uh -huh. And uh, I might say that perhaps there was a young lady by the name of Bunny Berg who later became Mary Wells because she married Burt Wells, and oh. then she was part of the Burt of the Wells Rich and Green Advertising Agency, oh. and she was part of that group that had moved to oh. New York at the same time. Ah, thanks. Interesting. David, was he considered genius immediately? I mean, the retrospective. The first thing I thought of is. Wow, he was way ahead of his time. He was genius, but was he appreciated it right away, or was he just too eccentric? Um, I think he was polarizing; that people loved him or hated him, and the people that um, really liked and I think understood his art, I 
believed that he um, held a very high stature uh, in the minds of some, uh, but then others, like I said, uh, the uh, pop art movement was disparaged uh, in the early years by many. So it really would depend on the, um, the particular individual or, or groups. Yeah. And I think it's all right to say this because this was brought up. About every semester, the professors would get together and decide whether Andy was a genius or an idiot. <laughs> and, it is, I, I, and I'm not being disparaging about it, but it, yeah, there was. was that connotation at that time. <laughs> Even in his student years. <laughs> I've always heard that he had an interesting relationship with his mother. Yeah. Do you, can you expand on that at all? Um, well, what I understood was that, yeah, he did have a, a very close relationship um, that she did, I, I don't think they necessarily lived in the same uh, unit, but um, that she, I, my understanding is that she moved to New York and apparently he was discreet about it if it wasn't clear whether she was there or not. Um, but um, from what I read and what I understood, understand from reading that, yeah, there was uh, an influence. And in an earlier version of this lecture, I did include a portrait of his mother uh, done in that uh, sketchy, brushy, uh, uh, neo-expressionistic uh, later style. Um, but yeah, she was a really important factor in his life. And supposedly, um, he, she accompanied him to a church on uh, Sunday mornings. Sometimes you'd go directly from late night parties uh, that lasted all night to church in the morning. And uh, from what I understand with his mother. So. And, and that it can maybe partially account for some of the religious or, or sacrilegious or religious overtones in, in some of his, his work that, that influenced from childhood. I, this is just a comment I had on uh, PBS the other night and on Roadshow, they, they were uh, talking about Warhol, and they had uh, some of the, or I came in late, but some of the early, this early book that was Shoes mm. that he had drawn in ink, and then he would have parties where people would come over, I guess it pre, predated or presaged the, uh, the factory idea. They would come and sit and color with aniline right. eyes. Yeah. But they all, they, um, the, the curator also commented that Warhol didn't like his own handwriting, so he would have his mother right. do yeah. the, the cursive writing because he loved her sort of idiosyncratic cursive yes. handwriting style. I wonder if you could comment about that. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, that uh, shoe, um, uh, à la recherche du shoe perdu. Um, yeah, that was the, the colors. I d didn't think I'd have time to go into so much detail, but yeah, the, the, the colors were apparently the result of friends that came to coloring parties to hand color the shoes. And um, it, it's, I, my understanding is that it's not clear whether the uh, writing, the handwriting underneath the shoes was his mother's actual handwriting or an imitation of the style of the mother's handwriting. But uh, that's another indication of her close influence on him. All right. David, thank you so much. You're and, very welcome. Uh, Thanks for your attention. Thanks.